I have been telling you, and I'm going to tell you one last time, I'm a broken human being. I praise God for His willingness to move into my life, to invite me to enjoy the pleasure of fellowship and partnership with Him. Without that, I would be in deep trouble. But he doesn't give up. Jesus is not only our Lord and Savior, but he is our friend. And he is the true north in the Seventh-day Adventist church. Would you bow your head with me as we pray? Oh God, our Heavenly Father, we call upon your name again this evening. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit. We thank you that your gospel marches on even when there are serious reverses. You do not give up. Don't give up on us, Lord. Be with us here tonight. Pour out your spirit, we pray again. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to turn your attention to uh, 1 Peter chapter 2 this evening. I think that this passage, or I believe that this passage is one that we have not, as Seventh-day Adventists, paid enough attention to. Because somehow along the road, we have been a little misled. Now I've said kind of a serious thing here. And some of you are wondering already, and that's good. I'm glad you're wondering. 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babes crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, the living stone rejected by humans and chosen but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and a precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now, to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. I built a house once. I call it my house on sliding bank because there was a bank behind the house that didn't want to stay where the bank needed to stay. And you know, uh, we planted grass in the backyard, and it was good, but then the rain would come, and the clay would come off the bank and onto the grass. And so I would go out, get a shovel, and put the clay back on the, on the cliff, and uh, then it would rain again, and this process went on for some time, And finally, I got an idea. I'm going to lick this thing. So I actually went out and rented a truck and took that truck to the rock quarry and said, fill this truck with big stones. And they did. 
And I took them home. And I laid the stones against the clay bank. And then when it rained, the clay came between the stones and onto the lawn. (laughs) And sometimes, depending on the amount of rain, it would also bring the stones along with it. And you know the process, I'd put them back and it would come and put it back and finally, one day I went and rented a truck. And I took all those stones, those stupid stones, and I put them back in the truck and halfway to the rock quarry, I recognized it wasn't the stones who were stupid. (laughs) I did not understand how to build a retaining wall. But I will tell you, friends, I have seen a master builder. He built a wall probably the width of this auditorium. He built it over varying terrain. He was a stonemason, and I watched him build, and as he build, built, I was always fascinated. I would come sometimes and just look at him and watch him pick up a stone, and he'd look at the wall, and he'd look at the stone, Some stones he couldn't use, but he would take sometimes his little hammer and he'd chip a little here and chip a little there and he'd find a place in the wall for that stone. And when he was done, it really truly was a masterpiece. Uh, Had you you taken, had, had the top been shiny, had smooth rather, if you had taken a marble and put it on the top of that, at any point it would not have rolled north, south, east, or west. It was perfectly level. It was a beautiful demonstration of building a rock wall. In this passage in first chapter or in first Peter, you discover that God is in the building business. That God Himself is continually making a house. I want to make two, two observations based on what this passage says. To begin with, first observation, in God's building, there are no superstars. There is no gender. There is no race, no ethnicity, no rich no poor, no age disparity. There is no independent individuality. And guess what? It is God who decides who gets in. That is not our job in spite of what we sometimes think. Now I am, again, wanting to make sure that we walk on safe territory, but the fact is that sometimes We are called upon to use godly discretion to deal with sensitive matters. I'm not referring to that. But when God builds a house, He invites all to come in. Then secondly, second minor observation, well, major observation rather, is that at the very moment that you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior if you are 8, 28, or 108, at that very moment, you have just become a minister of the Most High God. That's why he makes this statement. You, as living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Listen, friends, we need to get it out of our head that in the Scripture there is no superficial distinction like we make it between clergy and laity. There is no distinction. Every person in this auditorium who has accepted Jesus as his or her personal Savior is a minister of the Most High God. We need to quit thinking that only pastors are ministers. And furthermore, It is true that God calls different people at different times for different purposes. But listen, friends, God called every one of you. Now, I am not disparaging at all 
pastors. Uh, I was a pastor for uh, 24 years before I apostatized and went into administrative work. <clears throat> Read Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12, and what you find there is that the pastor has a specific role. If you read it carefully, you come to understand that the role of the pastor is to prepare the saints for the work of ministry. We're not talking about preparing the goody two-shoes for the work of the ministry. We're, calling the, we're talking about God calling the called out ones, that is every one of us here, to enter into ministry. There is no such thing as a Christianity that has nothing to do. There is no church of the great couch potato. There, is, there are no idols to indolence. God calls us to service, to be the gospel, to be involved. Now, this passage tells us three things about the church that I think are very important for us to understand as we live in the final days of human history. As a matter of fact, a lot of the concerns and the woes that we may experience in the church could be prevented and forgotten if we would implement this passage. <clears throat> First of all, this passage tells us about the nature of the church. Secondly, it tells us about the function of the church. And thirdly, it tells us about the glory of the church. What is the nature of the church? Today, I, I, I drove away from the campus and down along, I don't remember, Talent Road or somewhere in there, I saw a beautiful stone house. And you know, when you look at a stone house, there's always something fascinated about, uh, fascinating about it for me. Uh, the interdependence of stone and stone and stone is remarkable. Every stone is needed. Should you decide to arbitrarily start pulling stones out of the wall of a stone house or a stone fence, it, it, eventually you could collapse the whole building. And so it is with the church. The fundamental nature of the church that God is building is that it is to be an interdependent commonwealth. We need each other. We cannot afford to loosely say, we wish those people would just leave the church. Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 14 reads or says, just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. And then again, Paul in Ephesians chapter 19, verse, or, or chapter 2, I, there I added to the scripture again. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22 says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives. You as living stones are being built together into a spiritual house to offer sacrifices acceptable to God. So what are some of the characteristics of God's house that we need to keep in mind as we talk about its nature. Well, first of all, all are needed, all are wanted. All are needed, all are wanted. You know, in the church, and we're not going to talk about extremities tonight, but we have over here what, well, for you, this is the right, right? Yeah, this is the right, this is the left for me. 
But anyway, on the left, we have people who think a little more open, a little more liberal. And in the, this side, we have people who are godly, conservative people. And in the middle, we have a whole group. The largest group is in the middle. And somewhere over here, we have the people who eat tofu. <laughs> and you do understand there will be no tofu in heaven. Uh, people ask me, how do you know that? And I said, that's simple because God says no evil thing will be there. I do not hate tofu, and I don't hate put tofu down, but sometimes we give more credence to tofu and food than we ought to. We need the people on the left. We need the people on the center. We need the people on the right. I was renovating, a part of a renovating, uh, a, a, I came to a new church, and they were renovating the church. And they were bringing the pews into the building one, the brand new pews. And as they brought them in, I said to the pew builder, how many people can sit on a pew? And he said, 18 and a half inches per person. I said, okay, but how many people does that sit on a pew? He said, 18 and a half inches per person. And he wouldn't change his tune. You know, for some of us who sit in a lot of committees, it kind of stretches out to 20. <clears throat> but I thought about that a long time, that it does not matter who you are, it does not matter where you came from, it does not matter whether you are wealthy or whether you are poor, we all take up about 18 and a half inches on a pew. We are all needed. We are all wanted. We need to have an encompassing fellowship, not one of silos where we look at each other with suspicious eyes. Amen. Secondly, in the church that God is building, all recognize or must recognize that they are the same. That's a little bit of a hard pill for some folks to swallow because they have overcome. And others sitting next to them haven't. I want to listen to read to you Romans chapter 3, verses 21 to 24. But now, apart from the law of right, the righteousness of God, let me start again. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. The righteousness, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew or Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by grace through the redemption that came through Christ Jesus. Membership in the household means that I recognize that I may have a position that God invited me to enter into, but that doesn't mean anything. We are all brothers and sisters. We are all the same. We are all needed. He came to me, and he set up an appointment and came to my office and as the brother sat down, he looked at me and said, Pastor, I want my name taken off the books. And I said, well, why would you want to do that? He said, because I smoke. And when I smoke and come to church, people can smell my sin. I want to tell you what I said to him, because we used to throw people out of the church for smoking. <clears throat> I said, brother... I don't want you to take your name off the books. There's only one difference between you and the person sitting next to you on the pew. That is, you can't smell their sin. But wouldn't it be neat if God would attach a distinct odor to every sin? <laughs> then when we would come into the College Dale Adventist Church, 
we would walk up to the front door and it would be no problem saying, my name is Dan Jackson and I am a sinner. And the greeters would go, we know. I am not making fun of failures tonight or of people who are struggling with habits. What I am saying is that we are all needed, we are all wanted, and we are all the same. Some of us were planted a little earlier than others. The nature of the church, it is and must be an interdependent commonwealth. Friends, we need each other. Secondly, what is the function of the church? Is there a a, a grand reason, a grand scheme behind the building that God is building? You yourselves as living stones are being built together. Well, we're told. You yourselves are being built together into a spiritual house to be a spiritual priesthood, offering sacrifices, spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. You are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And God says this through Peter without any hesitation or regret. The church is to function as a priesthood. Now, what in the world did the priests do in ancient times? Help me this evening. Just call out, what was the role of a priest in the economy of the Jewish nation? Let me hear you. Boy, I heard a lot of things, but I didn't hear anything. (laughs) Yell it out. Try again. Offer sacrifices. Good. What else? Pray. Intercede. You see, when you look at the priest, he did all of those things. And he was doing something very special. Doing something very important. He was mediating, wasn't he? But what was it that he was mediating? He was mediating God's grace. Think about it broadly. You don't have to agree with me. But I have come to the conclusion that the priest in ancient days was mediating the grace of God. God the Father reaching out to the world prior to Jesus and bringing about the whole idea of sacrifices and what that meant. It was all about grace. The church must function as a priesthood. The priest stood between God and man. So must you and I. He mediated the grace of God in his divine interaction with the human family. The function of the church then is to be a mediator of God's grace. The church, according to the book Acts of the Apostles in the first pages, is to be the repository, the bank of the riches of God's grace. In that case, it is not appropriate to keep it in-house. I have a bit of a solemn call that I want to make here. And that is, please don't accept God's grace if you don't intend to be gracious. Uh, Jesus told a parable about this. It's recorded in Matthew 18, 21 to 35, and you will be familiar with it. We're not going to go there. But he told the parable of the man who owed a lot of money, the debtor. And he went before the Lord Master, and he begged him. But the word on the street, and the word that he got was, you're going to jail Your wife is coming with you and your children and your children's children until you pay the debt. I've always wondered about the logic of that. How are you going to pay a debt from prison? 
And the man gets on his knees and he begs and he pleads and finally he is given the opportunity to be free. He is forgiven the debt and he goes away and he runs out of that place and he's not far down the street but he finds a guy who owes him 10 bucks and says, give me the 10 bucks or I'll have you thrown in jail. It didn't take long till he forgot. And friends, the reality is this, that when we accept God's grace, you know, I made the comment the other night, God frees us from the debt of sin and guilt through our Lord Jesus Christ and His cross. And so while God takes away that debt, He indebts us, Paul says, in another way, He makes us debtors to grace. Don't accept grace if you don't expect to be gracious. What is Jesus like? We talked about that this morning. How great is His grace? How long will it last? Listen to Paul again, Hebrews 7, 24 and 25. Because Jesus lives forever, or He ever liveth, He has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, He is able to save to the uttermost or completely those who come to God through Him because He always lives to intercede for them. And again in chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner Jesus has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever <clears throat> in the order of Melchizedek. He ever lives to make intercession for you and for me. for our loved ones and our friends, for those in our communities, Jesus tonight is appealing. You see, friends, God will do anything to get his message across. Her name was Sandra. She had a, a walk with God where God had directed her life, literally, really directed her life. And one day as, or one evening as she lay in bed, she had a rather profound message from God. The message was this, go to Sacramento. She was in Hamilton, Ontario. Go to Sacramento and find a woman you studied the Bible with. She went downstairs to her father, who was a Roman Catholic Christian, and said to him, Dad, God told me to go to Sacramento last night. And you know, the father was a, a wise old man who had actually studied for the priesthood. And he said to his daughter, well, if you believe God called you to go to Sacramento, you better go. She bought an airline ticket. One problem that she had was that she felt the call of God to go to Sacramento to find a woman she had studied with. She had this one problem. She couldn't remember the lady's name. <clears throat> she flew to Sacramento believing that somehow God would reveal this to her but that stayed for two days before she could remember the name till it was brought back to her mind again. She still had one problem. She didn't know where the woman lived. But she had rented a vehicle. She had answered the call of God. And she headed out to the general area where the woman lived. But she still couldn't find it. And in frustration at one point, she drove her car into a gas station. And she noticed as she did that, that a car pulled right in behind her. And a young man jumped out of the car and started to proceed to her car. And at that point, she rolled the window up. <clears throat> so he came to her, and he said to her, 
What are you looking for? Because you are lost. And she said, how would you know I'm lost? And he said, at the last stop sign, you were doing this. Maybe I can help you. And she said, well, actually, I'm looking for a lady. And he said, what's her name? And she gave it to him. And when she gave it to him, this young man moved back from her car. And he said to her, well, that's my grandmother. I can take you to her house. Now, friends, I, I, this is a rather extreme illustration. But it is to illustrate the point that God doesn't easily give up on people. Now, could that happen? Or was she just eating too much cheese after 7 o'clock? <clears throat> He took her, this, by the way, this, if we stopped the story right here, it would be a great story. He took her to grandma's house. They went in and sat down, had pleasantries, and then grandma began to speak. She said, I am dying of cancer, but I have been praying for several months for God to bring someone to Sacramento to share the gospel with my grandson. Friends, God does not give up. God does not stop. He will do anything to get the message across. And friends, that means that you and I, by God's grace, need to be sensitive to the divine call, not just to make us Christians, but the divine call to move us into action. I have a thought I should be helping that neighbor over there. A friend of mine actually had that kind of thinking. It, he said, I, I need, he went and told his wife, I think God is telling me to give my car to our neighbor three doors down. So he said, I'm going to do it. And he went over and knocked on the, the door of the, the, the neighbor three doors down. And she said, yes, can I help you? He said, I just came to give you my car. <laughs> and she said, in, or through tears, my engine just blew on my car. Friends. God is calling you and me to be active in simple and practical ways to be the gospel. God does not give up. Your function and mine is to be a mediator of God's grace. That's characteristic number two. Characteristic number three, what is the glory of the church? You know, we have all kinds of concepts of what makes the church glorious. Uh, Barry Black is elected as the chaplain of the Senate. Boy, that raises the profile. But that is not the glory of the church. It's a wonderful thing. Uh, you know, we have a wonderful institution here. I am impressed every time I come back. I mean... Uh, a floor in the gymnasium that actually bounces. I mean, what, what more can you ask for in life? <laughs> this is a grand institution. It is looked at by Seventh-day Adventists around the world as a safe place to send their children. But I want to tell you, friends, this is not the glory of the church. A Loma Linda over there in California is building a new hospital. Fascinating structure. Going to cost probably about $1.45 billion. And when it is built, it will be one of the grandest hospital structures in all of California and perhaps in a whole segment of the United States. But that is not the glory of the church. I want to read a 
couple of texts. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 reads, Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that the Spirit of God dwells in your midst? When Paul uses the language that he does in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he's not talking about the pots and the pans of the sanctuary. He is talking about the most holy place. Don't you know that you are the temple of God? He is talking about the one place in the sanctuary where God's presence always existed. The church, your church, your congregation ought to be the one place in town where God is always witnessed, where He is always seen. For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will live with them and walk with them and I will be their God and they will be my people, 2 Corinthians 6, verse 16. What then is the glory of the church? The answer is found in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. The glory of the church is the ability to proclaim the greatness of and the glory of God. I want to read this quotation quickly from Christ's Object Lessons, pages 299 and 300, and it reads this, this way. We are to show to the world and all the heavenly intelligences that we appreciate the wonderful love of God for fallen humanity and that we are expecting larger and yet larger blessings from His infinite fullness far more than we do. We need to speak the precious chapters of our experiences. These exercises, I want you to notice this. You ought to write it down if you don't have the book. These exercises drive back the power of Satan to expel the spirit of murmuring. Praise the Lord, there's no murmuring in Georgia Cumberland. <clears throat> They expel the spirit of murmuring and complaint, and the tempter loses ground. Number three, these exercises cultivate those attributes of, characters, of character which will fit the dwellers on earth for the heavenly mansions. And then now listen, friends, because it gets very serious here. Such a testimony will have an influence upon others. No more effective means can be employed for winning souls to Christ than that personal testimony. We are to show the world and all the heavenly intelligences that we appreciate the wonderful love of God for fallen humanity. It is time. You know, this gospel of Jesus is not about the Seventh-day Adventist church. It's not about whether we can get more members than everybody else and slide into the kingdom. Bad thinking. It's all about the glory and the grace of God. We must build. We must be a part of the building of that spiritual house. Don't you know that you yourselves as living stones are being built together into a spiritual house to offer spiritual sacrifices to God? The house. I told you I built a house once. Best thing I did <clears throat> when I built that house is that I hired uh, an Adventist contractor who had a great reputation. He was recommended to me, and I asked I wasn't going to build a basement house, just a house with a crawl space in it. I asked him to put the foundation in under it, and he did. When I arrived on site, you know, the brethren invited me to come to this new place, and uh, they told me they would pay me half time if I would just preach, do Bible studies, visit the sick, visit the members, and 
be active with the board and on Sabbath. I couldn't figure out where the other half was. But anyway, they told me that I could do that. And so I started building this house. And it wasn't like I was a genius or anything. It was like a, 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 a Lego set because it was prefabbed. And so I set up walls. And one day I was framing in the inside of the house and the building inspector arrived. And you have to know that when a building inspector arrives at your work site and he jumps out of his car and he throws up his arms like this, that either he's a Pentecostal who just got ecstatic utterances or there is something wrong. <laughs> and he did. He jumped out of his car, he threw up his arms, and he made the grand pronouncement, you have built your house on the wrong lot. <clears throat> and I knew that was possible. Because a man who lived directly across the street, you know, he built a house, and then he built a swimming pool right beside it. And when the man from the adjacent lot retired and came from way up in the northern part of Canada to retire in that place where he could have a house on the lake, he went to the man who built the swimming pool and he said, you know, you have given me the nicest welcoming present that anyone has ever given me, a swimming pool. You built it right on my lot. And then he told him, he said, I'm going to put a chain link fence all the way around my swimming pool. But on your side, I'm going to put a double gate so you can use my swimming pool anytime you want. <laughs> so I knew it was possible. But I looked at that building inspector right in the face. And I said with all the courage I could muster, I have not built my house on the wrong lot because John Hanks put the foundation under this house, and if John Hanks put the foundation on this lot, my house is on the right lot. <laughs> and he kind of stood up straight. His arms didn't have any curve in them anymore. And he looked at me and he said, well, if John Hanks put your house on this lot, your house is on the right lot. <laughs> and he tucked his proverbial tail between his legs, got into his car and drove off into the horizon. And then it was my turn. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Here is the point, friends, and we must always remember it, that there is only one foundation. That foundation is Jesus Christ our Lord. He has invited you and He has invited me to serve Him being the gospel, being the gospel to those little children who are in need, being the gospel to refugees, being the gospel to people we don't even like, being the gospel to our family members, being the gospel to the people who surround us in the workplace, and on and on and on. You and I have been called. You, as living stones, are being built together into a spiritual house to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. Amen. Pray with me. O oh God, our Heavenly Father, the hour of this earth's history is late. We do not want to be motivated by fear. We acknowledge that you have called us. 
You have invited us. You have drawn us to the place where we have accepted you. You are our Lord and Savior. You are magnificent. Oh, Heavenly Father, help us turn the words into action. Not that we might be saved by these activities, but that we might show forth the praises of Him who called us out of the darkness into His marvelous light. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you.